But it's exciting to talk in 2019 compared with what I was saying in 2017 because so much has happened in the last couple of years and I come really with a lot of optimism and that's what I want to sort of um, uh, get across. Okay, so here's my jigsaw slide and in 2017 I, what I said was that there are pieces of the jigsaw, interesting little pieces of research all around but trying to put them together to understand the disease in 2017, certainly I didn't have a clue how to do with that. And so what we were going to try and do was institute studies where we could somehow see some light in the jigsaw. And I, I, I went back to the 2017 talk and saw that, and I thought, well, I can redraw that blank space there and say there are a few patches now that we understand quite well. There's still quite a lot of things we don't, but, you know, that gives me a great deal of optimism. And one of the main reasons, I think, is in the United States, there's been an enormous turnaround. There's been really outstanding mainstream scientists coming out of the woodwork and committing themselves to work on ME. So we've had, for example, the Stanford Collaborative Research Centre set up looking at the molecular basis of the disease, developing blood-based diagnostics, uh, drug screening technologies, and um, Professor Ron Davis, of course, has been at the centre of that. And then just this year, uh, there's the announcement of setting up of a Harvard centre, uh, which is going to focus on post-exertional malaise, in other words, what one gets, as Ross said, after mild or moderate exercise. And then in June it was announced, connected into these other two, there's a new Uppsala uh, centre being established in Sweden. And this will look at another aspect, small markers significant for MECFS, um, uh, which might be biomarkers in the future, and particularly the cerebral spinal fluid uh, as a source of neurochemical biomarkers, and we're kind of quite interested in that. And then there's an open uh, data centre being established at Stanford by the co-director of the new Harvard um, uh, initiative, although he is actually based in Stanford. This is Wen Zong Xiao. He's a biostatistician, and the idea is to get all of the data that people are generating up so other researchers can access it immediately to try and accelerate the advance of the science. So as a scientist, that for me is a very exciting kind of um, uh, 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 you know, initiative, really. And there's some, been some individual things that have happened which I think are pretty exciting too. The US Congress agreed to have an official MECFS day. So, you know, three or four years ago, this wasn't regarded as an important um, disease in the US at all. And so this is an enormous turnaround now to have it officially recognised. And, of course, we've had public awareness groups in the US be very active to try and not only make the public aware but politicians aware and advocate very strongly for funding. So ME Action is one of these and this came across my desk a couple of days ago on the right here. Uh, hashtag not enough for ME and this is a, a, a note addressed to the director of the NIH to say NIH is the greatest funder of biomedical research in the world and it's saying to NIH, you've got to do a lot more. So it's quite active, aggressive uh, advocacy for ME in the United States. Now, I have to say that uh, before this, the NIH is giving out major grants now for ME CFS. When I first met Ron Davis in 2016, he was an angry, well, it's going to say young man, but he's about my age, um, and he was angry because in his normal work, he's, he was director of the Genome Centre at Stanford, he uh, could get grants from NIH, you know, just kind of any, any time he put in. But he tried when his son became very ill and, um, and he got interested and found out about the disease and was very angry because there was no research going on, he thought. He applied to NIH and he got turned down and, uh, twice for major grants. And... But this year he got a, he got a multi-million dollar grant from them. So there's a bit of a turnaround there. And in the UK and also in Australia, there's been quite major funding given. 
there's New Zealand there, I've put that down, and you can see that's not yet a very happy place. It's really difficult to do, uh, to mount major research programs on this illness in New Zealand, and, um, you know, I'm very uh, grateful for all the people that, are con that are, ha has allowed me to actually do this, and I'll just refer to that in a minute, because um, when I look back, I just don't, I can't think how we managed to do it, and then we did it because people have given us donations and supported us and whatever. Um, the most exciting thing for me as a scientist is there are lots of new ideas now being generated, and I want to just tell you a little bit about um, some of them as I go through this talk. Now, so I'm much more optimistic, and, and here's a gauge of my optimism. When I spoke in 2017, this was my grandson, um, uh, my daughter, Emmy's daughter's uh, son, my, Emmy, my daughter has had Emmy for 30 years, it's quite debilitating uh, for every day, but he's just the joy of everyone's life. I have to say, now in 2019, he's, he's developed tremendously, like the Emmy research area, um, a little bit more difficult to take. I'd call him a preteen at four and a half at the moment, but, um, you know, so that's my gauge of, of hope, really. Okay, so the important thing for me as a researcher in New Zealand was to try and keep our research uh, team together. This is my uh, team in 2019. You can see it's quite a modest group because that's all we can sort of afford in terms of the people that I pay for employment. I teach uh, to third year medicine in, uh, on ME, the only uh, uh, teaching they get on this illness. Um, and Emily here on the left was in the third year class in 2018 and took a year off to do research and came and worked with us and we were very excited about that. And then in the middle there is Tina Edgar, my technician who's been with me now for 40 years and I struggle every year to get the money to keep her salary going but um, uh, we're doing that. And then I've got a genetics master's student that's working on epigenetic code work which I'll tell you about in a minute ne uh, next to her. And then the senior person in the group is Dr. Erin Sweetman, who came to me eight years ago as an honours student, started off doing a master's, did a, PA, did a PhD, um, graduating in 2018, and is now a postdoctoral fellow, and she's very experienced and understands the illness, and it's fantastic to still have, have, have her. The only trouble is now she's done all of her student things, we have to pay her a salary, so we have to raise the money to keep her going. So um, she's fantastic person. And then I had a PhD student, Angus, I think we heard of, uh, you know, he had, he had um, voted or something. Um, and he, he um, uh, in doing his PhD studies, um, the stress of that, it's quite a, a stressful thing, that uh, really worsened his ME. And so he's given up his PhD studies, but uh, when he's well enough, we've met on a Friday afternoon and just developed ideas on a, a, a neuroinflammation model, which I'll talk about uh, immediately after this, um, to explain a lot of the bigger picture stuff on, on MECFS, like, you know, why is it um, that after an initial assault you get this uh, response, what, what, explain, what can explain all of the symptoms, why do we have relapse recovery uh, in the chronic phase of the illness? And a lot of those bigger uh, questions. So we're pretty excited uh, uh, to get this uh, hypothesis, which is based on the stress center in the hypothalamus of the brain. There's a stress center, and as we know that MECFS patients are very uh, sensitive to any kind of stress. And so we've developed a model around that which could explain a lot of the features of MECFS, and this was published in the International Journal of Immunopathology and Pharmacology right at the end of 2018, and, and Angus well, and I were, were pretty excited that it was the second most accessed paper for the year in 2018. I was even more excited because one of our other papers was the first most accessed, which I'll mention in a minute. So it's good that we've got this out into the international um, uh, community and that it's being read and, and for us, you know, that was uh, very gratifying uh, given that uh, we feel very isolated sometimes in terms of 
um, not only you know, the number of people working on MEC if it's in New Zealand, but also the funding. So I just wanted to just give you a little bit of information about the stress centre and, and what is stress and why are we sensitive to it. And then I'm going to actually link into the Cordine study that uh, Ros mentioned as one of the drug studies occurring, because the people who run the small company Cortine were interested in stress, I think just stress, and getting a drug that managed stress, and realised, found out about ME-CFS, and now they've got ME-CFS as the centre of their drug trial, and I'll mention that. So stress, of course, is any disruption to the homeostasis of the body, or the balance of the body, and the important part of the, uh, our systems which respond to stress is the HPX, a PA axis, that's the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, and that prepares the body uh, to respond to whether it's infectious or a chemical or physical or emotional uh, stress. And there are sort of changes in the body that occur, growth and metabolism are suppressed somewhat when that occurs, and we see cortisol uh, levels go up for uh, an immediate response to a severe stress. Although, if it becomes chronic, then cortisol levels, in fact, go below normal. So that's kind of an interesting uh, phenomenon. So we focused on um, the paraventricular nucleus, which is in the hypothalamus, and it has some neurons, some brain cells, a cluster of brain cells, which seem to be the cells we have to deal with stress, to process the stress that we're whatever it is that we actually um, have to deal with uh, during our lives. And, uh, and some of these neurons, in fact, can produce a stress hormone, corticotrophin-releasing hormone. And now I'm actually connecting into the, um, to the, um, to the, the, the starting to uh, go into the, the drug study, which I'll talk about. So um, when this stress hormone is released, there are other neurons in our brain which have receptors for it. That is to say the hormone can travel around and bind onto these other neurons and affect change. And it turns out there are two stress states. There's a low stress state and there's a receptor for that. I'm just calling it receptor 1 here to, to keep it simple. And there's another receptor which can bind to which is for high stress states. And these two receptors apparently cycle um, back and forward on the surface of these neurons. And they act like an off-on switch, so that um, uh, uh, it, it means that normally if we suffer high s stress, healthy people, they can deal with it and they're not getting a high stress response all of the time. They can switch to a low stress response when they've dealt with the initial um, assault. So it's like an off-on switch, and you've probably heard uh, descriptions of ME. It's like a switch has been turned on and it's got stuck. And this is the kind of uh, idea uh, that the Cortine company um, is, is developing uh, a potential drug therapy. Now, what I should have said is that the receptor 2 what it does is it mediates an increase in the production of serotonin. Now serotonin, I always thought until very recently, was kind of a good thing if you made more serotonin. After all, you know, you don't get, uh, if, if people with depression uh, look to try and increase the levels of serotonin. But most things, are chemicals in the brain, there's kind of like a bell-shaped curve. Low is bad. There's a certain level which is good. If you go beyond that, it can be bad as well. And so this is talk, talking about elevated serotonin below, uh, above the healthy levels, I think. But, you know, these are just ideas at the moment, and I just don't know how correct this is going to be. But I read uh, an article to say, well, what are the consequences of such elevated uh, serotonin? And I looked at what was listed in it was increased pain, cognitive dysfunction, sensitivities to light and sound, sleep dysfunction, and then indirectly by stimulating other brain neurotransmitters 
mood, appetite, memory, gastrointestinal function, heart rate. I've seen those kind of symptoms before. And so, you know, many of the symptoms of MECFS remarkably, apparently, um, I'm not an expert necessarily on serotonin, could be explained by having abnormally high levels of serotonin. In other words, if you've got a re stuck receptor which is supposed to be modulating the effect of the stress and it just keeps you in a high uh, stress state all the time and keeps producing serotonin, this might be uh, 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 the kind of things that's happening in uh, MECFS. So this is a new idea and I'm not saying that I'm philosophically uh, believing this is this will, you know, explain ME, but it's an interesting idea that's worth, um, uh, 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 you know, keeping an eye on. So this small company, Cortine, I gather, was initially just interested in stress. And so they developed a drug which actually attaches to this high-stress receptor and uh, will make it recycle. That's the what I take from reading what they've done. So the idea is they've got now a hypothesis for what causes MECFS. Initial trigger of intense stress could be a viral infection, emotional, chemical, etc., which we know about. And they say that they think it causes this receptor 2 to be stuck. So it doesn't recycle. Now, as far as I can read, there's no actual evidence for that. It's kind of a, something they intuit, I have to say that. Um, so it doesn't recycle. And so even small amounts of stress that an MECFS person might get are recorded by the brain as a, as a maximum huge amount of stress and you get a, a response from that. So they've already got a drug available which binds to this receptor and they think actually gets it um, cycling on the surface of neurons and um, they think that this drug could actually work in hours, and the claim things they've written is that you could actually uh, solve ME just by putting one application of their drug on uh, for a few hours and it would all go away. Now, I think none of us in the room would kind of believe it's going to be as simple as that, but it's an interesting I idea, <laughs> hope. We, we, yeah, we, and, and, you know, I, with two people in my fam immediate family with ME, I hope too, and so when, you know, this is why I look at these things very carefully. So they've done a safety uh, trial and then now got approval, FDA approval, to go to a phase one, two clinical trial with this. So that's quite a big thing. So we should kind of watch out for this because this may be um, a new idea which has uh, much more traction than we might have thought. Okay, I want to now switch to our experimental studies. And our basic format is that we take 20 mils of blood from each of the patients who are in our preclinical studies, and I've established a number of co cohorts now. And then we purify the peripheral blood mononuclear cells. These are all the white blood cells, nuclear cells, etc. in there. And we separate the plasma. And we've done this suite of studies, detailed molecular studies. This is what one calls precision medicine. Most people who are working on patient studies say you can't get anything just by studying 10 patients and 10 controls. You know, we've gone ahead with, with a belief that if you do it by precision medicine, in other words, you look at lots and lots of things on well-characterized patients, you can get very meaningful data. And certainly, I believe that's what we've, we've actually got. So that suite of studies, which I'm only going to say something about the ones on the right from the blood cells, that would have cost me about $300,000 to do those, <coughs> amazingly, really. And as I say, when I actually added up, I thought, how did I ever get the money to do all of this? And I want to just acknowledge that because, um, before I go on, I mean, firstly, Enzymes has given me from time to time sort of money to initiate projects and that's very helpful because then you can often leave a money off that but it's also it's got us going I've had one conventional grant you might say my ME research from the New Zealand Lotteries Health Grant and then I've got money from Otago Medical Research Foundation two charitable trusts but mainly this has been funded by just 
anonymous donations, people coming out of the woodwork giving money, amazingly. So sometimes on a Friday, I think, how are we, um, how are we going to be able to employ the people in my group on Monday? And then something will happen which allows me to do it. And I've got one concrete example to tell you. And that is that when, in 2017, when my talk was videoed, a, a South Island farmer who's got ME read, uh, saw the video, accessed the video, and then he contacted me, and we had a bit of an, quite an aggressive exchange about what ME is and not and whatever, and I, you know, I respected his opinion, and we went back and forth. And next minute I found he'd given us over $100,000 towards the research. Amazing. Okay, so this year, uh, so we, we've got enough money to get to the end of 2019. I've got a budget for 2020. We're about, you know, we're about a quarter of the third towards our goal. And I was at the airport in Dunedin this morning, and uh, just before I got on the plane, and an email came in from the South Island farmer. He said, I'm giving you uh, $75,000 for your work. Yeah. So how's that for a good news story, you know? So that's how we've managed, and that's why I'm sort of very grateful to, to the, all of the people that have contributed, and in my response to them was that, you know, we'll value every dollar you've given, and hopefully, you know, it'll be used very wisely for the benefit of ME. So that's kind of how I'm feeling. And, of course, I've got two family members, you know, pretty badly affected, so um, it's pretty meaningful to me as well. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about Amber Hellowells, that's the Genetics Master's Students study uh, on epigenetics. And what I'm going to do is just pull out little parts of these big studies to kind of give you a bit of a flavour and to, and to tell the story. So what we know about DNA, and if you watch forensic programmes on TV, you know that DNA is made up of four units, A, G, C and T, and they're all different combinations, and we have three billion of these units in our genome. And we thought that was really what our genetic code was. It was we inherit it when our uh, DNA from our mother and father got together, basically, and we'd have that until we died. There was no change all through our lifetime. What we now realise is that there's a secondary code, it's called the epigenetic code, where on this invariant A, 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 G, C, T code, little tags are put on at various places throughout these three billion bases. And these tags can be coming off and going on and affecting what happens to the expression of all of our genes through our lifetime. It may be nutritional things can affect it or it may be an emotional experience we're realising it's very dynamic. It changes according to your life experience. And, um, and the actual uh, tag is just a simple little methyl group for those of you who are literate in chemistry, just put on at particular uh, places. So what we wanted to do, because there's evidence now that this can change in disease states, so we wanted to know, does the epigenetic code change between our ME cohort uh, uh, of 10 patients and controls. And so Amber uh, started to do that study. And the first thing she did, we got a kit, cost $5,000, just to look to see if we could find out how much of these tags was present in healthy controls versus um, uh, ME patients' genomes. And there was quite an interesting thing. You can see there's a sort of black and grey on that up there. So this is a bit of actual data. Well, in the literature, it says that as you age, the number of tags across your genome goes down. So my grandson, in theory, will have four or five times the number of tags on his genome as I do. And so at the left, we've got a patient group from the teens right through to near 80. And so if you can see those black boxes, they're high, uh, and then the next one is high, 20 to 40 age group, and then it goes down 40 to 60, it drops, and 60 to 80, it's low as well. And so that's, that's as the literature says, so we we're pretty happy to find that. But then when we looked at the ME people, you can see down in the teenagers with ME, 
they, they look like age healthy controls. They have many less tags. Half a percent of the C bases, the C bases will get the tags, half a percent as compared with 2% of the healthy controls. So that said as well, there's lots of things going on with ME and so what we wanted to do then was to do a detailed study where we looked at all of the sites across the genome where these tags are to look where they change and that's about 30 million uh, sites and so we've done that study that cost about $25,000 but um, it seemed very worthwhile doing and I'm just going to just take a little bit of the data and, and, uh, because it relates to what I've just uh, said so over on the left there what you're seeing is the nucleus of a human cell and those kind of line is supposed to be the DNA it's actually covered with those blue things which are proteins it's not just naked inside our nucleus and I'm just highlighting there in the middle that in front of genes there's like an off on switch and when the gene is on down here you don't find any or very many of these tags so here's the switch and without the tags that gene will, is, it's switched on it'll get expressed and will eventually make a protein from the information in that place but up the top there you can see with those little red things those are the tags and if you have a high density of tags it's like turning the switch off that gene won't be expressed and you've even got a state like a dimmer switch for a room where if you've got sort of a medium density of these tags you can get you can regulate the level of the expression just like the light in a room with a dimmer switch and that can affect things so that's really what we were looking for to see what genes are affected in ME compared with controls what, what genes are changed and I'm just again just selecting a little bit of data here one site that she found changes was at genes involved in serotonin which I've just talked about so two genes in serotonin metabolism these, uh, these flags to modulate the expression of the uh, genes uh, changed and then also in the corticotrophin releasing hormone that's the hormone I mentioned that responds to stress um, those changed as well so we are actually look when we're looking into the genome and the DNA we're seeing evidence for those kinds of changes which are invoked from uh, different uh, studies and I'm going to be talking uh, going on talking about energy production and we certainly saw sites uh, in front of genes that are involved in energy production so that gave us uh, a good indication that uh, energy production was going to be changed so just coming back to our overall study again what I want to do now is just to talk a, a little bit of show a little bit of data from our tra what we call our transcriptome study that's Dex we were looking now at all of the expressed genes so we've got 19,000 genes it's thought now and in fact Erin was able to look at 13,000 of them and we just looked what each of these individual genes were doing and I just want to show you a little bit of data I should say this was the paper that was most accessed in the International Journal of Immunopathology and Pharmacology it's actually a 2019 paper but went up online about two weeks before the end of the year and it still had more people reading it and downloading it of any other in 2018 so we're pretty happy about that um, and okay so we go on and so when you've only got 10 patients and 10 controls in the study you have to be very stringent with your biostatistics to make sure you're looking at relevant things so we put a 99% confidence on this that we only looked at things where there was a 99% chance that what we were seeing was correct and of, from the 13,000 we found 27 genes who had elevated expression uh, we were making more of the, the gene product and we had six that we, we were making less and the top three turned out to be in an inflammation pathways in fact the top one is a cytokine called interleukin 8 
there was about a six-fold change. And someone who saw this data and knows about interleukin, he said, well, people that are having that, they must feel incredibly yucky. And I said, well, they do feel incredibly yucky. Um, and then the other two genes there are actually trying to control inflammation. So we know inflammatory pathways are significant then in the MEFCFS condition. And just to show you how the data comes out, you express it up on the top panel there on the right. Those little dots are individual patients. So this is classic for patient studies. You get a span of data and your patients, a span of data for your controls, and you can see the red line is higher for the, uh, for the ME, ME CFS versus the controls, and that's significantly different. Okay, so that's, um, that was just the top three. So just to give you the conclusion from a vast amount of data from that study, what we found in what we call doing functional network analysis, that is asking the question, what are these genes, what functions are these genes operating in? And then secondly, pathway analysis, what pathways, biochemical, physiological pathways are they in? Uh, we got some very strong results that the immune pathways and inflammatory pathways are quite significantly affected. Uh, cellular stress response and oxidative stress quite uh, affected. So that wasn't such a surprise on what we know about ME. But the next one was that actually circadian clock function was affected. That hadn't been reported before. Now we've heard probably about circadian rhythm. You know, you've got your sleep-wake cycles and whatever. It was always thought just to be in the brain. But we now understand not very well, but actually individual organs of the body have their own circadian clocks as well. So we're saying ME, CFS people have some dysfunction in that. And, and that might not be surprising if you think in terms of difficulty of, of the sleep-wake cycles. Certainly metabolism, uh, we found that a number of the metabolic pathways were uh, operating at a low level, and this is consistent with the um, the Stanford study that I think Ros kind of mentioned, where they looked at all the waste metabolites and plasma and food. There were 20 biochemical pathways which were operating at a low level, and they said this was like a state of hibernation. That was a study published in 2016. And, of course, we're interested in energy production. Lots of things that... Um, uh, affected in energy production. So that was the overall um, conclusion of the study. And so we were interested in energy production, so I wanted to just show you a little bit of data from these two areas, a proteome analysis, that means we look at all of the proteins that are synthesized by the immune cells, because we're taking the, these um, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, and also now we've got an ability to look at the energy production by this instrument that uh, we accessed in 2018. So first thing, just a little bit of basic biology, what a human cell looks like. That's on the left there for those that you know, might be naive to this. And you can see those little biscuits there with squiggly kind of tops that are cigar-shaped. Cigar those are the um, factories in the cell called mitochondria where energy is produced. And if you actually sort of slice it open and look at this, you see the walls of them. It's hollow in the inside, but the walls go in and out. And the energy production machinery is on these kind of what's called invaginations into the, into the cell. And so this is a cartoon you might think this looks incredibly complex. In fact, it's incredibly simple with what's going on. So let me just, if, you know, nod off a few if it's too complex, but let me take you through it if it's not. So we start off with food down in the bo bottom left-hand corner. That is carbohydrates and fats. We have metabolism to degrade these. And there's one metabolic cycle that's important in the mitochondria called the citric acid cycle, you might have heard of, which actually feeds high energy compounds into the start of the platforms of the factory. So you can say these blue, bluish things, they've come out more grey with the lighting, but um, those are 
of various protein complexes that are taking part in the steps of energy production and we go from complex one, two, three, four, five and five is the one where you're actually making the energy. So I don't want to say too much about it except that you'll notice that on the left there this ROS comes off the left there. That isn't actually our ROS. <laughs> Uh, this is reactive oxygen species, and that's quite damaging. And there's certainly ideas that ME people might actually be producing too much reactive oxygen species, and that might be affecting mitochondria. So we've got an interest in that. That's going to be part of our 2020 program. Coenzyme Q10, you'll see there just between complex 1 and 2. Some of you may be taking coenzyme uh, Q10. That's a mobile component. It's very important in this process that can slot between the various complexes and you'll see down here in complex for oxygen you know this is why we need an atmosphere of oxygen and we need to breathe because that oxygen is used in this uh, energy produ uh, production process so that we can get to the final step where we actually make the energy and it's in a chemical form called ATP Okay, so that's, that's kind of the process of energy production. So that's what we're interested to see. Is there any mistakes or uh, changes or, or um, you know, dysregulation of this process? Well, just in the last couple of weeks, Erin has analysed the results from the proteome study where we're looking at all of the proteins that change in ME, uh, immune cells versus controls. And this is the list here. It's huge. And we can relate this to those things I've just talked about, the citric acid cycle. A number of things that are upregulated, those are in green, some are downregulated. Complex one, the first of the big um, parts of the factory where we're starting with the synthesis, we go to complex three, reactive oxygen species regulation. A whole lot of things which regulate that are, are not working properly and complex five which is the actual energy production then um, a lot of things changing so this amazed me that we found so many changes occurring interestingly enough there's an Australian scientist that's just published a paper called Paul Fisher and what he's done is to he's found uh, specific uh, deficiencies in complex five and compensatory things in complex one to try and actually uh, sort of balance up. But he makes this conclusion in this, uh, uh, his dysfun mitochondrial dysfunction theory that um, these changes may leave them unable to adequately respond to acute increases in energy demand. When we are stressed, we need to produce more energy. And so our mitochondria, these energy production places, need to be able to respond to that. And so the idea is that maybe um, they can't do that in response to energy demand. That's what he's saying. So his data is very, comp or our data is very complementary to his hypothesis. Okay. So if you're still awake, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about what we've done with this new instrument, which allows us to take live blood cells and analyze all of those steps in the, in the production of energy through those various uh, complexes that we talked about. And, um, it, and we can apply what's called a mitochondrial uh, stress test. So I'll just show you a little bit of data from that. So here's the cartoon I showed you before. And so we can measure the, what each of these complexes are doing in this instrument. With, with a special kind of um, kit which we apply onto the top of the instrument. We can measure energy production, we can measure maximal respiration, non-mitochondrial respiration, proton, and particularly the one that I'm interested in is spare respiratory capacity um, to say how much spare capacity do ME people have to respond to any demand, whether it be physical exercise, whether it be a stress, or whatever, whatever else. And we, these are different colours here, and what we're essentially measuring is these kind of coloured sort of things there and getting numbers from those. 
Now what that enables us to do is to calculate what's called a bioenergetic health index. And our hypothesis would be that healthy controls will have a high uh, a biochemical, bioenergetic health index, largely because they've got lots of spare capacity if they are challenged in any way as an you know, individual. Whereas we uh, would predict that MECFS patients, this, this, this thing between the arrows here, uh, will be much lower, and so they'll have a low index. And we'd hope that we could develop this so that we could give individual patients the BHI index so they could take it to their GPs or the social agencies and show their families and girlfriends and boyfriends so there's a better understanding of what the, you know, how the disease is affecting the individuals to explain that they might be a bit have to lie down, you know, occasionally or whatever, and uh, or more than occasionally. So um, I want to just show two things. So this is the trace you get from this machine, and this is the way it, when it changes profile, it's measuring different things. And on this one, we've got our most severely ill patient in our study group. In fact, there's a, I think the New Zealand Herald, maybe this weekend, there's going to be an article by a New Zealand Herald journalist, and he's a kind of a, prof she's profiling him. She's also going to talk about the lack of funding for ME research in New Zealand. And unfortunately, I think I was, I, I said some rather kind of things probably I wish I hadn't said, and I think those are going to appear in print as well. So it's good that some of us are from the South Island and we can go away and we won't be reading the Herald, perhaps. But, um, anyway, so here's the severely ill patient. And you can see how he compares with two age match controls. So these are, he's a male, obviously, he, uh, in his 20s. So we got two 20-year-old males as controls, and you can see they look very much the same. And you can see their mitochondria is working, uh, 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 working so much better. And certainly he doesn't have any spare respiratory capacity at all. So we have, at least with a severely ill patient, been able to show that there's uh, quite a significant effect. And so uh, we've done the BHI index. We've had to change our technique because it's so expensive to, if we just do one patient on a kind of a special um, a stress kit and plate that we buy, um, it, it, uh, we can fit about eight patients on a plate. So if we uh, if we just do it by one with live uh, fresh cells, it's just too expensive. So we've developed, Aaron's developed a technology to do it with frozen cells, and we're not absolutely sure yet whether this is uh, absolutely uh, okay. But what you can see there, the ME-CFS patients for the BHI index, the patient group clustered down there. What surprised us was the controls were kind of spread, although, uh, you know, there were... Uh, some of them were higher, some of them were down there, and we don't know that whether that's a technical thing as a result of the analysis or, or that's a real thing. And we've recruited 10 more controls to actually just in the last couple of weeks to actually test that out. Okay, I'm going to um, just finish by saying two things about a diagnostic test. Erin, as part of her work, looked at a stress response protein which has a slight change in molecular state to see whether we could develop a diagnostic test which then could be shifted into ChemPath laboratories. Now I have to say the results are quite pr uh, promising but we've kind of, we ran out of money to, uh, to do that kind of study and we, we really needed more personnel as well. But here's the preliminary data here and you can see that um, what we're looking at is this molecular change and the ME patients, average having had ME for 12 and a half years, so they're not newly, uh, patients newly with the disease, um, they certainly have this, but it's a kind of a spread, and the controls you can see are very tight, where we hardly see any of this change in the stress molecule. So that's got, a, I think, a lot of promise, and what we have to do now, if we're going to take this any further, would be to recruit people who are newly 
um, you know, within the first six months of the disease, just to see if it's a better predictor of of uh, for early diagnosis, and um, and then this may be possible. We've uh, we've published this and other things uh, this year in in, a, uh, in the journal uh, Diagnostics. But the one that, of course, has got all the publicity in the um, in the last year, of course, Ros mentioned, which is Ron Davis's nano needle. And so, what this is basically is a little test where you can measure the electrical resistance impedance of uh, a couple of microliters of serum of, of um, blood from. ME patients or controls, and what they found was that the controls, if you stress them, put a stress on them, a salt stress, um, the controls don't change at all, that's all the blue lines, but the ME, uh, uh, cells from ME patients, all, all of them, without exception, change. So this has got a lot of promise to say there's an illness there. Um, as of yet, what uh, uh, they haven't done is to look at what happens in other illnesses. It may not be specific for me, see if he's, and some of you may have heard Ron Davis on Morning Report a month or two ago. He's a very good scientist. He was very modest in his claiming, uh, but he said, you know, if you go to a, a doctor and the doctor says, well, you look quite well to me, and of course you can go and work full time, as my daughter was told by the designated doctor from Wins. Um, then, um, you know, th this might be a, t a test that one could have done. At least you can say, look, clearly I'm not well because my blood cells are performing very poorly. But it may be specific for MECFS. If they show this is actually a specific response, then this device would be a specific diagnostic test. And, of course, you know, from the good thing the US does when there's something promising, they publicise it really well. So there's been a lot of good publicity about that, and, and you know, I think it does have promise. Okay, last one was just simply to um, uh, uh, say our budget for 2020 is 124,000. Before I got to the airport today, I was going to bring a hat and take it round, but <laughs> we needed to actually get some. But now I can, you know, we haven't quite got the year, but we've got to 100,000. Um, and so we want to look at the changes in the epigenetic code after exercise and does that explain the post-exertional malaise because you might expect that we're changing the gene expression and so that, and that might affect the mitochondrial function and maybe people don't perform as well so we'd like to sort of do that um, we want to look to see whether the capacity to produce energy is compromised during or elapsed and we've had a couple of students, you know, um, we've just taken blood samples from them every month, hoping they'll go into a relapse, <laughs> haven't told them. Um, and they did, both the students we had, they had a relapse, so they said how their health was, you know, 7, 7, minus 2, whatever. Um, and so we've got blood samples and we want to look to see whether we can see what's happening in them when they go into a relapse. So that's an ongoing study. We want to look now at damaging reactive oxygen species in cells. And then there's a new, an, a, an engineer had an idea when he heard about MECFS and went and saw Ron Davis and they're working on this, that there might be, uh, this, this gene is in the pathway for degrading tryptophan, happens to be related to uh, serotonin metabolism as well. And he claims that this gene might have common mutations in it, such that if you get excess tryptophan, it's supposed to degrade it. If that doesn't get degraded. And um, for those people that have got the common mutations, it might make them very susceptible to MECP. So this is like a new idea. Uh, you know, it's out from left field, someone completely out of biological science. But, but I think, you know, it's one of the kind of ideas that need to be tested. So... I'll finish there. Thanks very much.